Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 255, featuring the second installment of my interview with Mr. Fergus Urquhart, the CEO of uh, Obsidian, a former producer at uh, Interplace Black Isle Studios. This part of the interview, uh, Fergus takes us on a little tour of his history, uh, how he got into this business, and then uh, what it was like working at Interplay, and then uh, the uh, formation of Black Isle Studios. Uh, we'll talk about Baldur's Gate, Shattered Steel, and the Fallout games. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Fergus Urquhart. All right, so how did you first get involved in the industry? I know you've started, I guess, started at Interplay, or was it, what, did you learn to program at some point? So, I, you know, it kind of goes back to... What, did you I, go to, did you major in computer science? Or, you know, no, I didn't, it? actually. I, weirdly enough, I majored in uh, bioengineering. Mm -hmm. And so, Brian, so bioengineering isn't like, you know, genetic manipulation it's more of bioengineering is uh prosthetics and medical equipment and stuff like that I, that's the I official was, story <laughs> yes the official story. no i thought it'd be cool to go figure out how to make bionic arms i mean that was really the that was what i thought because it was going to involve programming and mechanical stuff but no how i really got involved was i i was into you know into role-playing games and early computer games on ibm you know the original ibm pcs and the apple twos and i had a commodore i ran a commodore 64 bbs um, my, oh, really? I, what was the name of that? Uh, it was called Dargard Keep, and I was Lord Soth. Oh. That, was, that was my. That was <laughs> me. Dragonlance and, fan. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I um, was into computers, and then you know, obviously, had friends that were into computers and stuff like that, and games and that. And and then a friend of mine got a job at Interplay in customer service, and then I was looking for a job um, over the summer away from school, and he said there was a QA job available. So I I then went into QA and I tested games for two years. Um, and, uh, and then that was in 91, 92 and then 93, there was a like, um, a production assistant job for one of their senior producers. And I, you know, went and talked to him about it and he gave me the job. I mean, it was, it's sort of sad to say to people who really want to get into the industry now when it, it's hard, much harder now mm -hmm. Then it was, you, ha you, if you knew someone and like, you know, my first interview for the QA job was literally the guy, like raised his head and goes, are you Fergus? And I said, yes. He goes, okay. And that was my interview for to getting the QA <laughs> job. And then, and then my, my interview for the production job was uh, uh, a friend of mine. They had a racquetball court at Interplay. And so I finished a racquetball game, and then another friend of mine came up and says, oh, Alan heard you were here, and he wants to talk to you. I said, okay. So I was in my racquetball stuff, sweating, and I walk up and have my interview for to be a to become a producer. And um, I don't I think Alan asked me like three questions. I don't even remember what they were. And uh, he said, all right, when do you want to start? You know, and that was that was it. That was me getting a job. Um, and I think what was helpful for me was, uh, you know, while I was getting a job as a project manager, producer, um, I did understand computers. Like I actually wrote one tool, <laughs> one one tool for, for Interplay, which was to, um, uh, I wouldn't go to T, but but a very, very very simple thing that had to do with early con so some console stuff you needed to do, and uh, um, and other than that, I mean, I'd written a text adventure game, you know, for myself just to learn it uh, in basic, I think, and on the Commodore sixty four, and so you know, so I knew all that stuff, and I think that's what helped me be a good producer. Is I understood computers, I understood games, I loved games, and then eventually it was the opportunity because I was really into D anD D and. And I knew, you know, and I, I, I'd done a pretty good job as a producer. Then I got the opportunity to run the RPG division, which then would become Black Isle. What about <clears throat> Shattered Steel mm -hmm. for Bioware? Yeah. Was that back in 96? That was, yeah. So I was first, so that shipped in... Well, that shipped in 96. Shipped in 96, yes. Or late maybe. 96. Yeah. And uh, I think I started working, I can't remember if I started working on that in 94, 90. I mean, I know it would have been, it would have been... Maybe early ninety four, late ninety five, or late ninety four, early. 90, I don't remember. You were working for Bioware. No, I was working for Interplay. Oh, working for Interplay. So, so Interplay uh, published Shattered Steel, okay. and so I was the I was the Interplay producer, and that's how I met Ray and Greg. Um, oh, okay. To start off, so and I was their producer. Um, I wrote all the voiceover <laughs> for it. I wrote all the I wrote all this kind of basically the layout the the 
I guess the screenplay for all the um, the the uh, CG um, movies. Um, I designed some of the weapons, uh, and I spent a lot of time in Canada. Uh, so that was it. Was funny. That was I was actually for me. Um, working on Shattered Sea was the first time I ever went to Canada, and uh, which was interesting to me. I'm like, because I'd never been as a foreign country, so I mean, you know, for people farther north, like it's just Canada. Like, but I'd never been up there, and I like get off the plane, get in the taxi, and I'm like, oh, it's the United States, just north. Yeah. So. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so it was Shattered Steel was a mech game, uh, and it was a lot of fun. It was, it's, it was too bad about Shattered Steel in a lot of ways is that, um, Mech Warrior 2 Mercenaries, Mech Warrior 3 Mercenaries, 2 or 3, I can't remember which, but it was Mech Warrior Mercenaries was coming out. And our, I think it was, I can't remember, our marketing or sales department said the way to, 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 um, the way to, 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 how did they say it was something about like they were like they, they were worried about shipping too close. They said we're just gonna, we'll come out a week before them, and then we'll get our sales. And well, the gamers knew that. I mean, it was like whatever. I'm just gonna say my, you know I know Mech Warrior, and it's coming out next week. Why would I buy another Mech game today? No matter if the previews are good or anything like that. So it still ended up doing well, and you know Interplay made money and that kind of stuff. But unfortunately, not enough to make a sequel. Um, but then Sh- Shattered Steel Two became Neverwinter Nights. So I guess that was a good thing. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the Black Isle and sure. you know, the, the rise of, uh, of Black <laughs> Isle. Uh, you know, I was reading about the name, and they wanted to call it something else, right? Dragon Play, I think was... <laughs> Dragon Play, yes. yeah. But, you know, what was just... I mean, can you sort of set the stage for us? I mean, what was it like at this time, and what were what was going on that they wanted to create this new division? And, you know, what, how did they select the people for it? Right. You know... So I so the the reason for so the reason for the divisionalization so um, so Brian I think rightly recognized that as Interplay got larger and then in, and then the development Interplay development got larger that there would just be now like let's call it forty games under development or being published by Interplay at any one time and just having like one person in charge of all of these disparate and different games. Like, just didn't make sense. And so he said, you know, so he was like, okay, well, then let's figure, let's, John, you know, take the genres and split them into divisions. And then we have, then we put people in charge of these who then run each of these divisions like little businesses. So we have the RPG division and we'll have the sports division, we'll have the adventure game and the RTS and, you know, so forth and so on. And so eventually all of those, those different divisions. And they also, the idea was to create brands, um, you know, Black Owl being one of them, right? And so, that, that they could then create brands that they themselves then would get known for a certain style of game, and then the brand itself would be advertising. And so it was, I mean, it was a great idea. And, and I think that that, um, that really, I mean, that obviously led to Black Isle being Black Isle. Now, how did he pick the people? You know, I think a lot of it was just people that he knew already. I mean, people that were in the, in the, in the company. Um, uh, you know, the guy who ran the RPG division before me uh, was a guy named Marco Green. Uh, who then did sort of helped out on the voiceover stuff for both Fallout 1 and Fallout 2. Um, and then he actually was doing more stuff for Interplay just recently. But he, um, I, I can't, I, you know, it's one of those things so long ago. I can't remember if Mark already worked for Interplay, um, but Mark also, ha- I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, had sort of connections to uh, the pen and paper industry. And so he, um, and so that kind of made sense. He was the guy who knew it more than probably maybe anybody, I mean, knew pen and paper as an industry more than the rest of us who just knew it as guys who went and bought D&D books. And so, so he did it for a while. Um, and then it was in 96 that, you know, Brian was there like, okay, well, I think Mark didn't want to do it anymore. There was just sort of a, I don't know if it was a falling out. I, I never really got, I didn't really understand. I just knew that, you know, uh, my boss came to me one day and said, Hey, you know, do you want to run the, uh, RPG division? And of course said, no, uh, I guess that is, well, I said, of course, you know, and, uh, you know, that's, and that's how it kind of all happened. I mean, now what was funny, of course, is that now they, they raised me up to being a director and eventually I was a president of a division. But so I'm 26. I don't have a college degree, um, you know, and this, I'm at this company that's trying to go public. And now I've been put in charge of like a 60 person division plus 15 games that are in development at the same time. And you must and have done so, something between then and the, when you started off as the QA guy. I mean, you must have really <laughs> made an impression. What? You know, I'd like to say that I did. However... Interplay and the industry at the time were growing so fast that it was Interplay even had to have a rule that um, it was like people would go into QA 
and they wouldn't even be in there like a few weeks and they'd be pulled out to do other stuff. And so QA had to instill this rule of like, they, that if when they got hired, they had to have everyone agree and Brian like, you know, signed it in blood or something that the testers would stay in QA for, for no less than six months, you know? And then, and then there was so much like people would just pulling people out and all the stuff. I think Jeremy eventually changed it to three months or something like that. But yeah, it was just, so people were just getting hired. So just work needed to get done. Um, and you know, the industry was just exploding. And so, you know, I was really, I, I worked very hard, but a lot of it was right place, right time, you know? And, and I, I, I know that's not a good lesson for people nowadays, which says, you know, like, here's the, you know, here's the equation on how, uh, to run your own independent developer, you know, 15 years from now, but, <laughs> um, yeah, so that was the thing. I mean, it was just, it was sort of right place, right time. I've, now, I've heard you're a very but, modest guy, Fergus. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, it, it, I mean, it was, I was, it was luck. I, you know, I, in a lot of ways, I mean, it was, you know, I had a friend from high school was in a game, you know, is, was working for, he got, I got him a job and then, and then he got a job, um, as a, um, and in, in the, you know, in customer service, you know, I was sorry, he got, he was working at head software and he was in, in our D and D game with some guys. And one of the guys was from interplay and that guy said, Hey, we have a customer service job. So he got his job and then I got my job. That's no, like, you know, I went to, you know, I went to, uh, whatever I went to the art Institute for four years and I did this and I did this and I networked at E3 and that kind of thing. I knew a guy and I knew a guy who knew a guy in a D and D game. Okay. Well, we'll go with that. Huh? <laughs> I wanted to just ask you a little something about Baldur's Gate. You know, sure. It's definitely one of my favorite series. I'm wondering, did you have, I mean, how was this, was it just publishing or did you have a, like an influence over the, over the development? Of the games, um, so the original Baldur's Gate, I would say it was it was. I mean, they made the game, but it was fairly. I mean, there was a lot of collaboration going okay. on. I mean, we're, you know, they, it was one of their first games, and and like you know certain you know certain kind of tech little bits of technology that Interplay had. Like they got the we gave them like the Fallout sort. They didn't use Fallout Engine at all, but we sent all the Fallout source code and stuff over so they can see how we did stuff with Fallout or we're doing stuff with Fallout. Um, and you know, and we were up there a ton and reviewing all the design documents, but also at the time TSR was pretty involved as well from a standpoint of like the dialogue and the fiction and all that kind of things. And, and so we were like, we're, we're all up at Bioware a number of times. I mean, I was at Bioware a ton, but also TSR was up there. Um, but I mean, all in all, I mean, the thing is, is, you know, they had the idea, they, they are, had the idea and they'd already prototyped it and put it together of like, so this RTS style thing. Now that's what they had pitched me. They pitched me this game called Battleground Infinity. My part in it was, I guess, I mean, you know, it's my part in it was saying, well, that looks really cool. We have this D and D license. Why don't we stick them together? You know? And then my only other part in it really was at the time, like, so then I got a demo from the first demo I got from them was like, eh. the second demo I got, um, I was like, okay, I can see this. Like, I really can see like this was, it was still Battleground Infinity. It wasn't Baldur's Gate yet. And I was like, okay, I can see this game. I can see how this, Showed it to my boss. He said, "Ah, no," and so, and I was like, "No, <laughs> like I'm not going to take that, you know." And I'm not going to. And, and so, I was pretty good friends with the VP of marketing, and so I got it up and running on one of the programmers' computers. And I had her come over, and I said, "So," she goes, "Okay, I'm going to show this." And I go, "It's still early, but just think, this is D and D. This is think of it like like it's something like an RTS, but it's going to be a role playing game. It's totally." you know, blah, blah, blah. And I gave the spiel and she looked at it and for not being much of a gamer, she put the two and two together as well. And, and, um, and she just picked up my programmer's phone, called Brian and said, Brian, come up here and look at this thing. Brian came up, looked at it and says, sign it. And, um, I just like that. And that's how Baldur's Gate got started. You know? So I guess, so my, my part in it, I wouldn't say it. I don't have a, I can't, I mean, other than I also am the guy who named it Baldur's Gate. Um, and I still have an email from Ray that says it's the stupidest name ever. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, we just had to pick a name and everyone had all these ideas and no one was agreeing on anything. And I'm like, but most of the action, you know, at a certain point in the game takes part in Baldur's Gate. And I said, we'll just call it Baldur's Gate, you know? And, then, <laughs> and so it became Baldur's Gate. So, but yeah, I, I would say that, you know, other than, you know, little things here and there talking about stuff and things, um, really, um, like that would, a lot of my role in that was just helping make sure that it, you know, it was just that it even existed. That was that was the thing that I did. Yeah, it seems I seem to remember when I had Brian on. I could. It's been a while, uh, but it seemed like yeah. I remember he was telling me that there was a, 
like the licensing agreements that you had with BioWare and with, uh, I guess, TSR. Mm-hmm. Basically, it amounted to the game was just selling, you know, like gangbusters, but you guys weren't making very much. <laughs> um, Compared to publishers nowadays, maybe. Um, I, I think that, um, I, you know, and, and that's hard for me because I actually, I mean, I know the finances of Obsidian. I can't tell the finances of, of, of Interplay. Um, and so, you know, I know the percentage numbers. I know that they were high, they were higher than what maybe, uh, you know, combined a developer and a licensor will get now. Um, but um, Interplay, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go against what Brian said, but I know Interplay still made money. You know, and I, 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 now, now, did they make as much money off of the same number of units as compared to maybe one of their other games? No, probably not, because I think both group both groups had slightly higher royalties um than maybe or or say the royalty burden on the game was higher than maybe some of our other games uh but it's still they sold a ton of units so you know i mean worst case interplay had to make at least a buck a unit and you know Baldur's gate sold while we were there like two million three million so and back in that day that was that was that was that was a good amount of money for a game yeah, I had friends that didn't even play role-playing games coming up to me talking about, you know, Baldur's Gate. I mean, mm-hmm. Have you seen those enhanced editions? You know, do you have any? I, have, kind of- I keep on meaning they're done by Trent Oster, who uh, who um, was the by, worked for Byron was the producer on Neverwinter Nights. And actually, he was um, he was one of the main guys who did Shattered Steel as well. So I, I've known Trent for a long time, uh, and I keep on meaning to download it or try it, and I just I don't know. I just I have the stack of games just like this, and so I keep on meaning to, and I just don't. So, all right. So let's go back to Fallout Two, because I wanted to follow up on something. I you know I interviewed Tim Kane back in 2010, uh-huh. and we talked a lot about Fallout Two and N One, uh-huh. but he had a you know he was talking about how Fallout One, when he was working on that, nobody there really expected this was going to be a big game, wasn't going to be any big deal. It was right. kind of like the B tier, you know, mm-hmm. in the company. And then of course when it did really well. Uh, the way he kind of tells the story, and I'm sort of just paraphrasing, you know, what he said was, <laughs> you know, suddenly there were all these other people that were invested in it, and he sort of lost uh, creative control over it. You know, what what are your, you know, what was what did it look like from your perspective? Uh, it's pretty simple. I mean, I, I would say, you know, um, I actually it was funny not to tie the two things together, but Baldur's Gate was also, um, uh, Baldur's Gate also had very low expectations. Interplay had very low expectations. <laughs> oh, wow, Gate really? Had such, low, such low expectations that for the original Baldur's Gate, uh, Interplay's UK office said they did not feel that Dungeons and Dragons was relevant in Europe, and so they 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 would not forecast any units for it. <laughs> These people so are course, still employed. <laughs> uh, Interplay's gone pretty much, so no. But yeah. Oh. Uh, but as for fall, I think. I think what happened, um, there was a number of things that happened, you know, at that point is that, is that, so when we were, I would probably six months away from when we thought we were going to be shipping fallout, you know, and I talked to, you know, Tim Leonard and Jason just about what they wanted to do. And, um, and a lot of it was that they didn't necessarily, they didn't, they didn't actually want to go on and work on fallout too. And, um, and so I don't know if this was in reaction to what Tim was talking about or not. I just know my, my, I can. I have my window into it, or just what I saw and what I interacted with. Um, and so I actually, I have like, and I, if I go back and I probably find some old, you know, uh, old projections, you know, so I was planning out like 2008 and stuff like that. And I just had Tim's next RPG. That was my, that was my name for it because I didn't have anything. And so I think that, um, so then what happened, I think at that point, so then I put a different team on Fallout 2. And so, and so a different team started working on Fallout 2 probably three months before Fallout 1 came out. And it just, just from a standpoint of, getting designs together and kind of what would be the key features and all that stuff. And then, uh, then Fala came out and around that time, um, you know, Tim, Tim Leonard and Jason said, no, we want to work on Fala too. And so, um, so, so what happened was they like came in and said, well, you're the Fala guys. And so, and they, they liked some of what the guys had put together, but not all of it. And so a lot of the design for Fala two was thrown away. Um, and they kind of came up with what, what they wanted, what they came up with. Um, and, um, you know, and then, and then, you know, unfortunately as things happen, you know, I mean, they got an opportunity to go off and start Troika and, and which they took. And so, um, it was, that was kind of the early parts of Fallout 2 were very bumpy because you had one team start it, Tim, Tim Leonard, Jason come in and then Tim Leonard, Jason leave, you know, and so it was, it was sort of a rocky first six months for that project. And 
that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. If you just uh, watched uh, 254, you might want, uh, be surprised to see a new episode so soon. Uh, well, on the negative side, school just started this week, so I was way behind. So it took me a while to get that episode out. On the positive side, we get Labor Day off. So I was able to catch back up and give you a double header Matt Chat weekend. I thought you guys really enjoy that, especially with such a great guest on like uh, Fergus. Uh, definitely going to have some more segments with him, uh, at least one more, maybe two. So lots of great stuff. Uh, so stay tuned as always. Uh, also, as always, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much if you have supported this show. really means a lot to me, guys. Uh, and remember, as uh, I always like to say, you know, don't feel like you have to give you know, all of your disposable income to the show or anything. Uh, just whatever you feel comfortable giving is fine with me. I appreciate it all. If you can uh, support the show with a dollar per episode or $10 an episode, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with and what the show means to you personally, I really appreciate it, guys. So, so thank you uh, for that. All right, let's see. I got a little uh, news from the Matt Cave. That's some pretty cool stuff this week. People have written in. Uh, the first one is uh, Michael Hartman. Was a, he's a part of a team called Frog Dice. And they're working on a game called Stash, No Loot Left Behind. This is a multiplayer online role-playing game, turn-based combat, and epic amounts of loot. So I'll post a link to the Kickstarter video there. They got 13 days left, uh, 36, as I am posting this, they've uh, hit 36,000. They need 50,000 to uh, make their Kickstarter goals. It looks like a pretty fun game. I went ahead and supported it, so thought I'd pass that along, see if you guys were interested too. Uh, that's uh, Stash, No Loot Left Behind by Frog Dice Games. Uh, also, one of my former students, uh, Cody Reimer, uh, he's doing really well for himself. Uh, really proud of you, Cody. He uh, wrote in about a video history of the double-barreled shotgun. And this uh, really kind of blew me away with this uh, quality. It's really nice uh, retrospective on the uh, double-barreled shotgun in not only in first-person shooter games, but the history of the actual weapon. So I thought that was really good. Kind of like the mix of uh, video game history and real, <laughs> well, video game history and the actual firearm history was pretty cool. And then finally, something that uh, might just be totally mind-blowing. I've been in touch with uh, Susan Manley, who put me in touch with uh, David Klein, uh, one of the, uh, I guess he's a former president of uh, SSI, not maybe I, not quite sure about that, but anyway, he's definitely heading uh, this uh, company called TSI, and they're trying to resurrect the old uh, gold box style games. They've done uh, these guys, the team they put together are the same guys that worked on the Curse of the Azure Bonds, a Pool of Radiance, Secret of the Silver Blades, <laughs> all those uh, wonderful games. So I don't have a lot of information about this yet, but I'll definitely, I'm going to stay on top of this and let you know uh, what happens. Uh, however, they, what, what's really cool is they've invited me to uh, moderate a panel with them. Uh, some kind of a panel they're doing about resurrecting IPs, I guess is the gold box thing. So the short of it is, hopefully I'll actually get to go to GDC again this year. Uh, this will be in March. So uh, all of you guys that are going there, uh, hopefully we'll get to meet up, at least uh, chat a little bit, maybe have a beer or something. I'm uh, really looking forward to it. Also, uh, you know, I'm actually toying with the idea of uh, hiring a little film crew, or at least my old friend Michael Bretkowski, uh, who's a camera operator. And maybe do a little something there, a little GDC Match Hat special, uh, maybe even release something on a DVD or Blu-ray. I don't really know yet. I'm just totally brainstorming this, but, you know, heck, I will be there with all of these uh, legendary game designers all around, so it'd be a shame to waste that opportunity. Anyway, I'd like to hear your ideas on... Uh, you know, what you'd like to see come out of this, uh, Matt, <laughs> Matt Chat at uh, GDC, any uh, thoughts or suggestions would be appreciated. All right, whew, man, lots of stuff. All right, what about that ale of the week? All right, so for the ale this week, I've got another one from the Southern Tier uh, Brewing Company, and it's uh, actually another pumpkin-based ale. So I really love their pumpkin. I didn't even know this existed, but they have a different variety of it. This is called the Warlock. A really cool name, cool logo there. Got a pumpkin wizard kind of thing going there. Imperial Stout brewed with pumpkins. Uh, so the pumpkin is the just an imperial ale. Uh, this is an, the Imperial Stout. So I really like stouts as uh, well as uh, uh, the, <laughs> I guess, non-stout ales, whatever you want to call that, pale ales, I suppose. So I'm really excited about this one. It says, Warlock is brewed to enchant your palate on its own and also to counterpoint our Imperial Ale Pumpkin. Make your own black magic by carefully pouring this imperial stout into a goblet. 
Master of the Underworld. Dark and mysterious, this Blackwater series is serious about high gravity. <laughs> Pumpkin pie aroma. So anyway, I don't see how I can go wrong with this, but it'd be interesting to see if I like this better than the, the pumpkin. But I'm sure it's fantastic, so let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this Warlock here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Not quite sure if it's a demonology Warlock or maybe Affliction, but... Anyway, smells really nice. A bit of a pumpkin pie spice, obviously. Uh, no mistaking that, but I, I think there might be a little bit of a cherry... A little bit of a coffee-like uh, aroma to this one, too. You really have to, to try hard to smell that, though. Really what you're smelling is that uh, delicious pumpkin pie uh, aroma. That's, you know, I would be surprised if I could tell, <laughs> to be honest with you, if I had this and then a pumpkin and another drinking horn. I don't even know if I could tell you the difference based on smell alone. So let's give it a taste. Oh, that's good. Okay. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Bunch of stuff going on here. Now you get that same sort of pumpkin-y taste that you did with the pumpkin, but this one's definitely more bitter. Get a bit of a, like a, a cherry, uh, cherry, what is it, maybe a little cocoa-like quality, coffee-like flavor, caramel. Now let me try it again. Yeah, so lots of stuff going on with that. Sort of like you took a pumpkin and mixed in a little bit of a mudslide and then ratcheted up the bitterness here. Uh, definitely more of a acquired taste than the pumpkin. You know, I think just about anybody could enjoy the pumpkin. Uh, this one, on the other hand, you've got to be okay with some more bitterness, a little bit more of a uh, alcoholic taste. You can taste the alcohol a little bit more in this. I'll try one more time. Yeah, just a... Uh, Kind of like the pumpkin, but a little bit uh, less sweet. Definitely more bitter. Uh, I still like this very much, but I would, uh, you know, definitely prefer the pumpkin to this <laughs> uh, warlock. You know, uh, but your mileage may vary on that. I'm going to go ahead and go up. Uh, I'll go up five out of five drinking horns on this as well. Just because I, you know, it's, they, they're still some of the best pumpkin ales I've had. But given the choice, I would definitely go for the pumpkin over this one. But if you like the more bitter, more hoppy-like quality, or if you like really strong stout flavors, uh, you probably want to go with this one instead. But anyway, uh, really good stuff either way. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, struck with Fergus and how he keeps talking. To me. He's, he's such a humble guy, right? And he kept talking about how he just lucked out with his job. Uh, so I was looking for quotes about luck. And I found a, a quotation that I just thought really uh, made a profound point. It just kind of spoke to me, really. This is from Brian Tracy, who's apparently an author of a bunch of self-help books. You know, go figure that. Uh, it's a very inspirational quote. It goes something like this. If you want more luck, take more chances. Be more active. Show up more often. See you guys next week. Maybe we can cut a deal. Jack. Jack is dead, my friend. You can call me Joker. And as you can see, I'm a lot happier.